You're checking out the Investor Shed Podcast with Nick Beveridge and Jeremy Kitchen. They're on the path to financial freedom and they're taking their community with them. Stay tuned for the best free real estate investing advice on the internet. Welcome back to the Investor Shed Podcast. So glad you're back. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, try to stick around for at least another 30 seconds. I'm Nick Beveridge, here with my beautiful co-host, Jeremy Kitchen. Good morning. The beautiful Jeremy Kitchen is in the house. How are we doing today, Nick Beveridge? I'm good. I'm, uh, you know, I've been looking at analytics on our show, and boy, oh. things have been growing. Yeah. People have been listening. People like it. I love that. Looks like the overwhelming majority of people, they don't stick around till the end. Well, hey, I want to take this opportunity to thank every single person who listens or watches our podcast. Uh, you're the you're the lifeblood. You're the reason we do this. And even if you didn't do it, we'd still do it. So we just want to let you know that you can't get rid of us, but we really appreciate having you here. Speaking of appreciation and having you here, we got Rachel Rhodes on the podcast today. <laughs> yeah, Rachel's great, but I'm still angry about you guys not listening until the end of the show. We'll talk about it later, but let's talk, <laughs> let's talk about our guests. So Rachel was really cool to have on. Obviously, we've had her counterpart on one of our previous episodes. Um, Rachel is a very young lady, and she's uh, doing some really, really cool things. And uh, she really puts us to shame as far as like success in our early 20s. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. You guys are about to hear the one of the most incredible stories of a very, very young person starting her entrepreneurship at a very, very young age. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're going to get to hear why as well. Yeah. She's got a cool story. She provides great insight and just uh, just a joy to talk to. So uh, without further ado, instead of ado, 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 thank you, Nick. Um, what, kind of, uh, what kind of treat should we be enjoying for this episode? I would say nacho cheese Doritos mm. and put some cheese on it. Throw it in mm. the microwave. Mm. Let it burn. Mm. Take a bite. Burn your tongue, mm. but enjoy this episode. Here we go. Welcome back to the Investor Shed Podcast. I'm Nick Beveridge here with my co-host, Jeremy Kitchen. Good morning. Top of the morning to you, Nick. How are we doing today? Better now that we're um, we're embraced by the presence of Rachel Rhodes. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Rachel. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, Nick and I haven't done a podcast, like I said, in about a week and a half. So what I think we're going to do this time is we're just going to let you handle everything. Yeah. Is that Okay. <laughs> no <laughs> okay i didn't think so uh either way thank you so much for joining us today rachel we appreciate it um why don't you start off by just telling us a little bit about yourself if you don't mind oh gosh um <laughs> so i've told my story a lot so um it goes pretty fast uh, but i've had a unique um uh, life so i started college when i was 13 graduated with a uh, bachelor's and two associates when i was 17 um, from there, I decided I didn't want to, I was pre-law and I didn't want to be a lawyer at that point. I didn't want to work 80 hour weeks. And then, so I decided I would work on getting passive income through real estate. And the next step, um, was to get my real estate license. So I did that when I was 18 and I'm 20 now I've done 43 transactions, um, retail side for real estate and I've done four flips, one wholesale, and I've done most of my flips through creative finance. I love it. That's the podcast, everybody. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> yeah. No, like, there's a lot to unpack with that, Rachel. Obviously, you started college when you were 13. Like, I didn't even have, like, a developed brain at 13. Can you tell us about that and, like, how how that jump-started your uh, career? And obviously, like you said, you didn't want to be an 80-hour-a-week person or a 40-hour-a-week person. Um, what what was the drive and what was the, what was the turning factor for you that thought real estate was the place to be? Um, so, I was always super motivated. I... Um, I was pretty antisocial as a kid, actually. Um, so I read a lot, um, but I went in and I was going to skip a grade and they told me my IQ was too low to skip a grade. So they recommended that Ohio has a program that I can go to college in the evenings. And so I did that. And then I eventually switched to virtual school um, for middle school um, because I did start in middle school. Um, and then I did triple enrollment. So I got credit for high school, middle school and college all in one with one class. Um, so it was it was great. I didn't have to deal with everything like that. Um, but I started drop shipping when I was 14 before I could start working. Um, tell everyone what drop shipping is. So for me, I was buying products online on DH gate, um, a wholesaler site and for pretty much pennies on the dollar. And then I was reselling them at a higher cost and I was doing them with, um, 
shoes. Um, so I was buying them for $100 and selling them for $500. I did that twice a month at 14. And so, um, yeah, I started seeing the value in some kind of alternative cash flow or income system. And that kind of started me on my track. Um, and then I started working three jobs as soon as I turned 15 until I was 18. And then I decided that was just a lot in addition to college and everything else. And I wanted to find a different revenue stream. Wow. That is, that's so crazy. Um, first off, like you, like you said, um, you said your IQ was too too low to skip a grade. Mine was too low to like continue going in education. <laughs> so yeah, Jeremy always had summer school. Yeah, yeah. I like, I was always playing catch up. Like I, I just don't understand. Like and and you were drop drop shipping. Is that what you called it? Yeah. I, I've never even heard that term before today. To oh be really? With you. Yeah, yeah. So like. Oh, it's pretty popular in like the I don't know. Just kind of you can turn it into passive cash flow. It's um so every Amazon store that you see. Um, they're drop shipping. They don't actually have the products in their hands. Um, a lot of times they have an Amazon account, so they'll keep it with Amazon and they'll just buy in bulk. Um, but I actually did handle the products. So it was less drop shipping and more reselling, but pretty much the same thing. How did you go about finding shoes and making almost a 500% profit on those? I, I literally went online to look at like designer shoes and I found them on this site and, um, they, guaranteed that they were verified. Um, I think they were made in the same warehouse. I didn't market that they were the legit shoe, um, but eBay didn't market as a fraud um, or a fake. So they were fine with me reselling them um, because they were made in the same warehouse. Um, but yeah, I was literally just searching on there. Um, I'd done, I'd watched a few YouTubes on it, but yeah, I was just searching on there and I found a product that looked kind of cool. And then I looked on eBay to make sure it would sell for more than what I bought it for. And it would. So I, I kept doing that for about a year and then that kind of dropped off and I got busy. Okay, Rachel. So what kind of mental trauma did you have to go through as a child to be on such a rampage of success for the last decade? Oh, so much. <laughs> <laughs> so much. Uh, my mom was a mail order bride. So. Oh, okay. Keep yeah, going. so I'm also bilingual. Um, <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So so you you you've had life experiences, obviously. That's that's so crazy. I mean, like like when I was 13, the only thing I really cared about was honestly hanging out with Nick and playing video games. Like that was what we did. Oh, that's so cool though, that you guys knew each other. Yeah, yeah. Like I've known Nick since I've been six years old. So like this has been a lifetime thing. We're a uh, lifetime heterosexual uh life mates. So oh. <laughs> Yeah. So I'll... Thanks for clearing that up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 13. I didn't know God. 13 I didn't even know how to jack off I didn't know anything <laughs> when I was 13 I we played basketball in my driveway and played Metal Gear Solid <laughs> that was about it so obviously like you've been um you've just got this crazy what is what's the word I'm looking for your your drive's crazy I I don't understand it. And for anyone listening, how, how does somebody get on a level you're at? Obviously, like Nick was saying, you know, you went through a lot and you, you kind of hustled really hard. But was there any secret behind that? Oh, have you ever read Angela Duckworth's Grit? No, it's on my list, though. OK, it's one that you should absolutely read. Um, that really does break it down. Um, why I was successful and what Nick said, it really does relate to hardships in early life. Um, I did go through uh, my parents' divorce and then my dad had another divorce. Um, and so it was kind of a hectic family all the time. And that really contributes to grittiness is what Angela Duckworth calls it. Um, and so I think that's a lot of it. It's, it's really this innate um, part of me that just has to prove myself right, that I am, I am enough. And so... Yeah. The unfortunate truth when it comes to highly successful people is that they all have a, like three traits that are very, very in common. And, and one of them is they feel like they have to prove themselves. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're insecure, they're driven, and they're trying to prove themselves. Yeah. And, they're, and they are um, uh, not easily distracted as um, when it comes to jumping and tackling um, a problem in their life. So, um, I do commend you. Unfortunately, yeah, you, you go through some mental trauma. Everyone has mental trauma though, but you just, uh, you, you took that. And instead of, you know, going on this path of maybe drugs and alcohol to, um, deal with it, you're, you're proving your worth in this society. And I, and I, I appreciate you and what you're doing at your age. And I, and I'm really proud of you and I'm, uh, excited to see where you go. Cause I mean, you're so fresh in this and you're already just like, showing everybody up uh who's been wanting to invest in real estate and I, and I think i just saw on facebook you just 
you just got even got your first uh, wholesale check, right? Yeah, yeah you I did talk about yesterday. That? Um, yeah, so that was a deal through social media, um, which just speaks volumes to how much social media works and just power of connections. Um, and so actually, cause I'm not from here, I'm from Ohio. So when I moved here, I added everybody that I could on Facebook to try and get a bigger sphere here. Um, but so a seller reached out, um, saying that she needed to sell her house and that she was considering either going on the market or just selling it for cash. Um, we didn't know that we were actually competing with a few other wholesalers, but we beat them out. Um, we offered a little bit over that. So we offered 190 and then we ended up um, selling it for 205. Nice. Little, uh, little chunk of change in your pocket. That's awesome. Um, and just take it back real quick, Rachel. Do you mind telling everybody how old you are right now? 20. <laughs> she already said that. I didn't hear that. You were, you were talking about all your successes. I missed, I missed it. I'm sorry. Yeah. It gets, it gets blown over a little. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, just, just like just hitting that home, right? You're 20 years old. Like I, I didn't even, I don't even think I was in college at 20 yet. <laughs> and I only did one semester of college and we can all debate on whether college is, you know, good for people or good for useless. investors. Exactly. So. Absolutely. All right, good. Useless. As long as I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to. <laughs> no. Yeah. No, if I have had, if I had had to pay for it, I wouldn't have. Absolutely not. But it was free. So it was, I'm glad I did it, but it was, yeah. No, I, I've looked at jobs for paralegals here, which I'm completely uh, like eligible for, qualified for. They pay $17 an hour, which is literally less than McDonald's. Yeah. College degree means nothing. Yeah. I've seen this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, what I think, I, I think the, you know, there's all these stats out there that show that like people that go through college typically make way more than people that don't. And I think what people forget to realize is that the people that go to college are the type of people that want to better themselves and they're willing to invest in themselves. Um, and those type of people, whether they go to college or not, they're going to make more than your average person. Oh, yeah. No, it is absolutely correlation and not causation. And people forget that a lot. So after college and after you obviously went ham with a lot of things, you went into the real estate business and you said you're a real estate agent. How many, how many transactions? Was it 43? 43. 43. Okay. And how long have you been doing that? A year and a half. So I started in November of 2021. Awesome. A lot of what you're doing, are they on the buyer side or they're on the seller side or kind of a mix? Both. Both? Yep. I do both. Um, I, yeah, I go hard. Um, I make 70 to 150 calls a day. Um, with all the leads that I generate myself, I outbound prospect. Um, so yeah, I do a lot of things. <laughs> I don't just wait for people to come to me. Um, so it's a grind. Jeremy and I make that many calls in a month, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe yeah. on a good month. <laughs> like, and I want to talk about that real quick, Rachel. Obviously, because you're making all these calls and you're making all these connections, obviously you are seeing the dividends of your work. Um, is there a certain formula? So obviously within 70 to 100 calls a day, like like what's your limit on that? And and why why so many? What What is your why on that? Oh gosh. Okay. So, um, I have last year's numbers that I looked through and this year's I'm going to have to do in 2024. Um, but for last year, I calculated that every phone call I made, um, equated to $39. So every, every phone call will lead to a deal and that deal is worth so amount and how much I made. Um, so every phone call is $39. And so every time I pick up the phone, I'm going to pause you right there. Cause I, I did the same um, the same calculation when I was two years into real estate, but I think mine was more like $7 or something like that. But it was, but it was enough to be like, shoot, just make 20 calls a day. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. But go ahead. Sorry. I wanted, I wanted to let you know that you're not the only one that has done that before, but that's it's motivation, bucks, right? I, yeah. I want like the encouragement to keep making calls. Cause it's not fun. It's absolutely not fun. And there are leads that have registered in my site and they want more information. They still tell me to go screw off. Um, so it's not the, most fun. And then the outbound ones are even worse. The FISBOs don't want to talk to you. Um, but except for the ones that do. Yeah. I don't even think they want to, but it's sales, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. can, can we talk about your funnel real quick? Obviously I think we're kind of jumping around a little bit, but I think that's just fascinating how you're making so many calls and you equivalent that to how much success you actually need. Uh, and it gives you a tangible number to work with. Um, what does your lead funnel look like? Obviously with things that are coming through your website, how, how do you get people into your website for for a conversation like that? So for buyers, I market listings because buyers are looking at houses to buy. They're not looking for a realtor. Um, so they just, you know, they want more pictures of something. So they click on my link and they register to see more than one picture. Um, so it's kind of clickbaity and that people get mad, but I don't care um, because they still register and it's forced registration, which produces less in conversion, but I get more leads and that's all I care about. Um, 
And then for the seller side, they are searching for an agent. So I have a Google business profile that has 25 plus reviews, I think, uh, because you have to be over like 15 to actually show up. Um, that gets posted to a lot. And then um, social media, of course, helps. And then um, Fizbo's expired and then just circle calling. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so can we go back to when you first decided to get your real estate license and what, what made you want to go down that road? Yeah. Uh, actually, I was in one of your um, investor meetups. Um, I was already in the process of getting my license, but that kind of pushed me a little bit more because um, I wanted to be just like you. Aww. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, but that was that was kind of the thing. I knew that I wanted to invest and have passive income. So it made sense for me to get my license so that I could do my own deals. So have you felt like getting your real estate license has, has helped you kind of push your way towards um, being a little bit better of an investor or at least like having the... Okay. Yeah. You're just nodding your head. Yeah. Um, can you talk to us a little bit of like the pros and cons of having your license as an investor? I don't know that there's too many cons other than when you flip houses, there's more liability. Um, the pros have been that I can make offers in seconds instead of reaching out to another agent. Um, if I had a full-time job plus trying to do real estate, I just would not have the time. I run into a lot of deals because my buyers will send them to me and they're looking at them. And then if they don't work for them, I might try and take them. Um, so I just run into that. And then I have so many more connections just being in real estate than I would if I was in a normal nine to five job. Yeah. All true things. Man, you answer it so quickly and efficiently. It's amazing. Yeah. But um, that's what I've been trying to spread for, for a decade. The message of being, get your license is not all that bad when you want to be. In no, it's, it's awesome. Honestly, you just, you have to take the leap though. Um, and you have to have savings. And a lot of people just don't have that. Um, I've learned more and more um, that just people don't even have $500 in their bank account. And so you can't survive for six months without a paycheck. You can't take that leap. And so that's, that's been wild to me. I don't know. I have a skewed version of reality that everyone's like me and I'm trying to knock that off. So no, I think you're going to find that not a lot of people are like you, Rachel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like you, you could um, talk to a hundred people, do a, do a blanket statement, you know, just talk to a whole bunch of people on the street and ask, and if anyone started college at 13, raise your hand. If anybody was selling shoes and making flips and making a profit at 15, raise your hand. Like nobody's going to do that because you're on a journey of your own. And I think it's, it's really cool. Um, are you licensed in Washington or are you licensed in Washington and Idaho? Just Washington right now. Okay. So real quick on that one, just um, with co Washington contracts too. Uh, when you guys are doing off-market deals, do you have to disclose that you're a real estate agent as well? Yes. Same like out here. So I wasn't sure if that can be considered a con or not. You know, it's just, yeah, I am a real estate agent, but I can list your property for you too. So it's. I think people give you more trust when they know that you're a professional. Um, you give someone a badge and they're a professional, right? So you, I say I'm a realtor and, oh, okay, you've got some kind of credibility to you. Yeah. And I think it depends on how you deliver that message too. I mean, you can you could really do a bad job of delivering that. Like, by the way, I'm a real estate agent. So, you know, uh, <laughs> or you can just be like, yeah, it, and I am also licensed in case you want to go that avenue. Yeah. And that's what we, we try to explain that as well. It's yeah, maybe we can get you more money on the market because we do have a fiduciary responsibility to the client. Um, but yeah, it's a weird balance because on the market, we're trying to get them the most money we can. And then off market, we're trying to get them the least money we can. Right. So. You got to walk that little line there a little bit. As an investor, you don't want to make it a secret that you're licensed. Like it's not a bad thing. It depending on how you deliver it, but just, I mean, it's, it's a, it's another pro for them. You know, yes, I can buy your house for this. Um, and I'm also licensed in case you want to go another route. Yeah, there's just more options. And it's great because we can beat out other wholesalers that way too. We can get listings. Um, I do want to talk about your investments, Rachel. Obviously, with um, all the residential and, you know, real estate stuff, you've done a bunch of transactions. But I want to talk about your flipping and I want to talk about your other experience in investing. So what was your first investment property and what did that look like for you? Ooh, this is the one that um, started me off. Um, so it was a little property on Portland in um, 2021. And we, my team leader actually bought it. And I told him that I wanted to start flipping and that I wanted in on the next one that he did. And he offered it to the whole office and he said, anyone that wants in can get in. And so I bought a 1% share of that flip. Um, so I paid him $3,000 and I got a 1% return. Um, so I ended up making um, literally $300 on that deal. So I got $3,300 back. 
Nice. Um, and then I thought he was cash cash at that point because it was my first deal. Um, and so I thought, oh yeah, that's, that's fair. You know, it's cash cash. It's his money. That's it's equivalent to that. Um, but he ended up using everyone in the office's shares to fund the hard money. <laughs> so he was $0 out <laughs> and then he made the majority of it. Um, so after that, I did it on my own with Matt. Is, wouldn't that be a 10% return? Yeah, 10%. He made 30. You said, we said one. I'm like, did you make $30? That's awful. <laughs> That's awful. No, the property was 300 Maybe yeah. it was 1% a month? No. it was. So the property was $300,000 all in. So I gave him 3000 So that was 1%. So he made 30000 times 1% is 300 Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so with that, obviously, how long were you in that deal? Like, was it... Four months. Okay. And how old were you on that first deal? I was 19. 19. So, I mean, you put $3,000 into a deal and you made, you know, 50, 50 bucks a month or something like that. That's. Yeah. I mean, it was like a little introduction. So yeah, I was, I was fine with it. I still got kind of exposure and then got to list the deal. And so that was, it was a good introduction. I remember when I made my very first hard money loan, it was like very similar. It's like 10%. Um, I think I lent 30 grand on a deal. And after a few months, I got 33,000 back. It wasn't like, wasn't huge, but it's, I mean, I felt like it was way safer in that deal than just put it in the stock market, stock market or something like that. And it's all proof of concept too, when you're lending out money like that and you're getting a little bit of a return, like, oh, this works. There's money to be made in this. And if you take the initiative and you end up doing the projects yourself, obviously you're taking on a little bit more risk, but you're taking on a bigger reward at the same time. So um, let's talk about your next flip then. So you did that first one. You made you made a whopping 300 bucks, which is not bad again for 18, 19 years old. And uh, what'd you do after that? So then I joined Matt's team um, and he was flipping, wholesaling, all that kind of stuff that attracted me to the team. Um, and then he agreed he would do one with me and partner up on it, just do a JV, 50-50 um, on that one. And so we both funded um, the cost for hard money and then we bought a deal on market, credited our commission towards the closing costs for hard money. And then um, we, that one's under contract right now. So that we bought that a year ago, but it's just now selling. Oh yeah. I see that on social media. That's, that's the property. Okay. So uh, what, what'd you buy it for and how much do you plan on making when that sells? So we bought it 145. We put um, 35 into it, 45 into it. Um, our break even is 180 um, for hard money. That's what we owe. And then um, we ended up putting like a little bit of, over it cause we ended up going over budget. Um, of course, but, um, and then, so our break even on the market to get all of our money back is two ten, I think, and we're selling it at two forty three. So we'll make 30. So Rachel, um, on a flip like that, that takes a little over a year. I've done plenty of those. Um, I usually always learn a few things. Um, on this flip, it, what would you say would be the biggest thing that you learned on on this flip that took a long time? And I'm I'm sure there's like 20 things you can start getting out of your mouth. But if there was one or two things that you want to share to the world about flipping a house that takes a year, um, what kind of recommendations do you have, Al? So this one could have been a three-month one, but we ended up moving into it um, just to kind of cover those payments and, you know... Um, and we were thinking about refinancing it and keeping it. But this was my first real one on my own. Um, and I think the biggest thing is just contractors. We went through so many contractors on this one. It was an absolute nightmare. They, oh, <laughs> yeah, it was it was awful. You don't pay hourly. Um, that Yeah, just don't pay your contractors hourly unless you run a construction company. Um, yeah, that was the biggest thing on this. And then... Yeah, just, yeah, contractors were a huge issue on this. Um, they left one of the windows unlocked and someone ended up breaking in and stealing all of the copper wiring. Um, I didn't know people still do so, that. Yeah, they did. And so then we had to get an electrician out and then our contractors were here when they weren't actually here. Um, and so we ended up spending a lot more going through a couple of different contractors and then one contractor said he could do it and he couldn't do it. And so then we had to go through another one. And, so on the next one that I did, I really hammered down a contractor and negotiated price up front, had a contract up front, 
um, talked about the timeline, talked about repercussions of the timeline wasn't met, all of those kinds of things. You're learning and you're taking the steps it takes to learn, obviously, because, you know, no, nobody knows this. There's, there, there's guidelines out there and there's books out there that we can read, but you, the best teacher is experience and, and figuring out what you're doing and like, oh, that didn't work. I know how to fix it next time, though. And that's going to be the, the ammunition you need to move forward um, on your hard money loan. And were you living in the house with your hard money loan? I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't care. <laughs> oh no, they know. They it. know. Okay. A lot of hard money lenders won't lend on a primary residence. So it's, uh, it wasn't meant to be, um, but we were talking about refinancing it and then decided we didn't want to live in this location anymore. Um, so, yeah. Hey, so going back, uh, to talking about contractors and paying hourly versus maybe just getting a bid, a fixed bid. Um, this is something I took a long time to realize that doesn't always work out the best. Sometimes it works out great. You know, if you're working on a flip where there's just all kinds of unpredicted stuff and you just always have a guy there if you're babysitting them. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, what I've learned over time is that contractors, if they're getting paid by the hour, um, they're, they're in incentivized to milk the clock. Um, contractors that are just paid by the job, they're incentivized to just get it done as fast as they can to move on. Um, and it's better to go with the latter. <laughs> Absolutely. And then you really don't have to babysit and yeah, micromanage. Even if you think you're going to spend more on a fixed bid versus hourly, um, it's usually the way to go. Right. And what I've learned too, like, obviously if you give a, a contractor an incentive to get it done in, you know, X amount of time, two, three months or whatever, like, Hey, if you get this done in two months, I'll give you an extra two grand, like that they're going to get it done. And that's... You know, it's a, it's a price to pay, unfortunately, but your hard money payments are going to, yeah, your hard money payments are going to eat that up anyway. So it doesn't matter at that point. And at that point, you're just getting it done quicker. So yeah, every day you hold it is another 150 to 250. So on a low end flip. Yeah. People don't realize like it's, it's holding costs are <laughs> insane on projects. I know Nick knows this too. I'm just kind of getting my foot in the door on that. But anytime a project's not done when it's supposed to be done, it's, it, it eats into your net profit. Right. And that's, it's not what we want to do as investors. Yeah, time is money is so cliche, but in the flipping game, it's so true. All right, so you guys got that one. That one's on the market right now, and I think you're getting a lot of good uh, good feedback on that one. Um, do you, have you guys done any other projects? I know you talked about a little bit of creative financing you got do, you, you've done as well. Yeah, so after that one, um, Matt got his own partnerships that would fund 100% uh, of the cost up front. Um, so he kind of went that way, and then I found the same thing. So I went the other way, um, and I've you know, still had Matt. So he was able to kind of guide me on how to do everything, but I found my own money partner at that point. And so we, um, ended up talking to a seller about, um, seller financing it for six months. Um, actually I think one of them was a year term as well, but we ended up talking to them about seller financing it to us on interest only payments for six months to a year, um, for two of their houses that they owned. And then we were able to flip those and they actually gave us the money to renovate it too. The seller. Gotcha. So you spoke about joining Matt's team at that time. Were you guys dating at that time when you joined? Okay. Gotcha. Were you, did you start dating before you moved in together or after? Before. <laughs> hey, we don't know. Yeah. Some of this can be business is, relationship stuff. I have no idea. What, what is it like working with your spouse? It's difficult for sure. Um, but we just, we don't flip together. Um, we don't have rentals together because, um, Rentals, I think, would be fine, but the flipping, we disagreed on a lot of stuff. Um, I'm a lot more of a cheapskate than Matt is, so I I think that that was where the issues with the contractors were, too. Um, but I just deal with people very differently, and so I won't overpay someone more than they're worth. And he's very okay with just throwing money at it and seeing if it works out, um, and so we didn't agree on that. Um, but everything else was fine. Yeah, I'm like the opposite. I'm so willing to invest with partners on flips but like i'm always sketchy about rentals i'm like uh i mean this is a long you know this is a commitment like marriage <laughs> yeah no that's that's very true and we don't have rentals yet so um he has rentals but we don't have rentals together so yeah i could see how that'd be a point of contention obviously i mean you guys have different personalities and different things you're trying to achieve but uh you know your your, your trajectory is heading towards the same spot so it's 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 hard, but I, I can see how that'd be. Do you have any tips for anybody listening for people working with their spouse or their significant other, like how to make it work in a more efficient way? 
one's got to handle the money and then one's got to handle the project. I think that's just how it has to work um, because we were both doing both things. And so we were clashing on um, expenditures and money managing and then managing the contractors, managing the project and the designing. And there's just so many jobs like filtered in there um, that it would have just been better if um, one of us had just been managing. OK, here's how much money we have. Go spend it um, versus like, what if we go over budget? We can go over budget. It's OK. No, it's not OK. <laughs> It's never okay. It's never it's never okay. Um, but uh, you've obviously went over budget on you said your first flip, right? Two out of the four, yeah. And it's a common theme, I think, with going over budget because you know it's it's a rough guideline. You get in, you start tearing things out, and you're like, oh, this is going to cost a little bit more than we all anticipated. Um, do you have any other advice for how to stay on a on a budget? Oh, that's hard. Um, if you're doing your first one, it's very different than if you're doing like, I don't know, your hundredth or whatever. Um, just because I've, I've met both of those people and they're very different mindsets. Um, when you're doing your first one, walk at least 10 contractors through it and ask what's going to be. Why does this cost so much? Um, you can very easily get taken advantage of. They can tell you it's $10,000 to paint a room and you probably wouldn't blink as long as it fits in your budget. Um, but then when something big comes up, they're going to say it's a lot more and, you know, they uncovered it just now and it's going to add to your going over budget. Um, so I think that's that's the biggest thing, just because you don't know what things cost and you need to know what things cost because something could come up and it will come up. Something always comes up. So maybe leave a little bit of room in the budget, too, just so that you have like you're not you're very max when you're doing your bids and stuff. Right. Give yourself a little pad for sure. <laughs> yeah. Anything you want to add on that, Nick? No, I mean, I'm the king of going over budget, so you probably won't like it. But I have a different philosophy about it. You know, I, I, I tend to set low budgets with the anticipation that we're going to go over, um, but I try not to tell anyone. Um, so I intentionally like set a budget that's probably like 40% lower than it should be um, and say tell everybody, hey, this is what we need to hit. Um, because if in the past, I, I've done flips where I, I just set a realistic budget and we tend to always go over that because people try to stay within that budget on every scope, but then there's all these things that come up that they don't realize and then we go over that. Um, so that's why I always go over budget because I always weigh under budget what it should be publicly to people. Um, That's interesting, Nick, because we partner a lot on things, obviously. Uh, but when you tell me a budget's X, and now I'm just in my head, I'm going to know you're just a lying, lying dirtbag about it, and it's going to cost me an extra 50K. <laughs> I am, yes. I. Well, now, for those that get to listen to the Rachel Rhodes podcast, <laughs> they, will, they will know my true intentions. I'm a big fat liar when it comes to budgets because I don't want to go over a realistic budget. Noted. This is all noted, Nick. This is good stuff. I'm learning today. <laughs> Um, so going forward, Rachel, like, um, you got a couple flips, you guys are doing uh, awesome stuff. Again, you're getting that huge momentum going like, like what, what strategy are you trying to implement? Is there one lane you're trying to be in or are you trying to really swing right wide right now? Ooh. Um, so I think I know where I'm headed and, um, it actually has changed a lot over the past few months and it keeps morphing and changing and my goals keep adjusting. Um, but over the past week, I think I've really solidified them. Um, my dad actually reached out to me, uh, my biological dad, and he, he makes really good money, um, but he can't retire and he's done working. He's pretty much at the end of his, yeah, end of his rope. Um, he, yeah, he's getting older and his job is really stressful. They're going through three lawsuits right now with that company and he's the CEO. So that's, that's really hard on him. And he just was talking about, he just said, I can't, I can't do it. And I was like, well, you know, I've been looking at buying rentals in our hometown, um, back where they still live, where they can still manage it. And, um, the cash flow over there would be four to a thousand dollars, like 400 to a thousand dollars per door. Um, and so I was like, let's just, let's just do that. So my goal is to get 10 rentals over there and replace our living expenses. So then in the next year, my dad can go and retire. I love that. What's, um, is that back in Ohio? Yep. Okay. What part of Ohio? <laughs> well, you know, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not writing anything down or anything. Yeah, but. I know. Um, <laughs> Southeast. So border of West Virginia. Um, it's a really small, just really small town. And then, um, we're looking at Parkersburg, West Virginia too, where my mom lives. Um, just because it's just 10 minutes away from my hometown and it's the same property value and same, same cash flow. And they're just, a, they're a coal mining town. So it's just kind of blue collar people. It's, more expensive to actually rent than it is to buy, but people typically rent just because they can't buy. Um, but they'll rent for 
10, 15 years long-term tenants. That's the thing too. Like, obviously like you were kind of cryptic about where it was supposed to be and that's okay. But what I've noticed is you can tell people anything and nobody's going to take action on it. Anybody like nobody cares, but it's, it's just fun to know. Like I could tell people like this market right here will get you a thousand dollars a door and nobody's going to do anything about it because the action takers won't. Yeah. Well, no, it's scary and it's, it's far, it's really far away. If they didn't live there, I'd be scared of going to an out of town market just because it's unfamiliar and stuff, but I do know the market and I know they'll be there to manage it. And I'll probably have to fly home a bunch, but that means I get to see my family more too. So, and it's right off. So it works out. Yeah. So I, I've always heard about West Virginia that there's like a bunch of really cool people there. Um, <laughs> is that true? Like inbreds? <laughs> like like in, in the West Virginia state? Like inbreds? Oh, those? <laughs> um, it depends how far into the woods you go. <laughs> Um, No, West Virginia is like the creepiest state. It's a lot like Washington, but historic. Like you've got Indian burial grounds. You've got the like some of the first settlements ever. You've got so much history there and so much that's just undeveloped and it's underpopulated. And so you could legitimately get lost in like the hills of West Virginia and just be gone. Um, And people have actually done that. And there's like horror stories out there. Um, So yeah, there's a lot of like inbreds in those places where there's just like these little like off the grid communities that nobody wants to like find. Um, But other than that, like, no, they're normal people. Like they're, yeah, they're normal. Yeah. I was always curious why, why it was such a weird state. Like, cause it seems pretty beautiful. Um, in photos and stuff it's beautiful it's exactly like washington it's freaking beautiful it's no different like when i moved here i was like oh okay this is like where i came from so washington didn't really impress me that much with the scenery but (laughs) um no it's it's gorgeous it's affordable it's it's crazy affordable um I mean, there's not too much opportunity there. The biggest um, city in West Virginia is Charleston, and that has 49,000 people. And that's like the biggest. Oh, really? Wow. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, we can move on from West Virginia, everyone. Sorry. Nick, just love the people out there. I love it. So. Yeah, no, they're great people, though. They really are. It's just don't get lost in the hills. So speaking of horror stories and getting lost in the hills, though, um, do you have any horror stories from any of your investing experience? Like anything that's just... Any story that's just been an absolute nightmare to deal with? And if you do, uh, can you talk about that with us? Oh, yeah. So many. Um, All of them relate back to the contractors. And then (laughs) um, so there was obviously the crackhead that broke in and um, stole the electrical. Um, We ended up hiring one guy off of Craigslist and we asked him to demo. There was a living room and a kitchen and a wall in between. And so we asked him to demo the wall in between so that it's an open floor plan. He demoed every single wall in the house. Oh, wow. Wow. So that was really fun. Um, so don't do not do Craigslist. <laughs> I flipped a house a couple of years ago, or, or I, I did a burr. Um, but I hired this demolition company for the first time ever. And I walked through the, the place with the guy and showed him what, what to demo, what not to. And um, yeah, they demoed the wrong bathroom. Like the one bathroom, the master that we were going to keep. And it was just completely gutted when I got there. <laughs> like the next day, I was just like, oh. Come on. <laughs> then what do you even do? I mean, like, we okay, we, we didn't pay that guy, but now we have to spend thousands of dollars to go fix it. Also, his bid was like 2400 bucks, which I thought was like, that's why I hired him. But he he accidentally screwed up his, like, his estimate. It should have been nine grand. And he tried charging me nine at the... At so you want to charge me $9,000 for a bathroom that you weren't supposed to demo? <laughs> no. There's a lot more to demo on that property, but um, yeah. I've had a demo horror story as well. Cheap is not always better. So what's the fix for that? When when you're talking to your contractor and they mess up big time like that, like, do you just tell them like, hey, you screwed up? Like, I negotiate. I I negotiate so hard with them. Um, Because, so I've thought about this and the trajectory that I was on back then, um, it was, you know, if I do 10 flips a year and I pay you 30 grand per flip, that's $300,000 a year, dude. Like, you need to be available for me. And if we want to have like a long-term working professional relationship, you need to be understanding and like there, there for it. Um, But none of them really understood that. And then if it was over the next five years, okay, you can retire after that. Like 300K years, a contractor that has like two subs. Um, That's decent. And it was, you know, 30K a month. Um, So no, I negotiate the crap out of it because it's just, you, yeah, you just messed up my entire 
like numbers on this deal. I have a plan and you messed up my plan, dude. <laughs> Assuming you're a dude. Yeah, and that's so hard going through so many contractors because you get one to realize that and then you have to explain to the next and the next and the next. Um, but the yeah, another horror story with that contractor, um, he was super cheap. I loved that guy. Um, he he was very much there for it. He would do the work fast. It would be mediocre at best, but it would it would get done and he wouldn't complain. Um, and then randomly one day he just started talking about how he needed more money. And um, we ended up giving him an extra eight grand because we really did like this guy and we just wanted to give him some money. And it's like, here's an advance on everything. Like we, we want to keep you, um, keep coming back. And then uh, he just never showed up again after that. So that sucked. I still refer him out though. If other people can snag him for a deal, then it's great numbers. He's super cheap. He charged um, 16 grand for an entire flip. Plus materials. That was all inclusive for a 700 square foot house. So he lost money on that one and then got his eight grand and took off. <laughs> yeah. He was like, I'm out, guys. Um, yeah. So the next one, we actually had like four contractors in a line and they had to bid each other down. And then we took whoever was the lowest um, that could show us work that was actually good. They couldn't just be some crackhead off Craigslist. It had to be, hey, this is what I've done in the past. Um, here's pictures of my work. Here's what I specialize in. And then they would just go down the line just... So do you have any tactics on negotiation with contractors like that? Obviously, if you get four of them in a line and you're like, all right, the bidding starts at 400 bucks and they start bidding themselves down, like, um, do they have a point where they think like, are they all, are they all in the same room when you're doing this or no? I've done that once. <laughs> um, that was fun. <laughs> um, yeah, they, yeah, eventually one of them was just like, I'll just do it like for this. And I don't care if I make any money. I just want like more exposure. <laughs> Um, but usually it's just, hey, this guy gave me this bid. What can you do? This guy gave me this bid. What can you do? And just go back and forth um, and just try and negotiate the best deal that you can. Yeah, very good. <laughs> uh, anything you want to add on that, Nick? No, I wish I can do that. I have a hard time. I Actually, I recently did it with landscapers. Um, I put out a bit like on Facebook. I'm just like, hey, I've got seven jobs. And I had photos of each one. I'm like looking for a landscaper that can take everything on. And I had... Uh, 30 something people reach out to me and um, 14 of them said that they would actually go and bid these jobs. So I emailed all 14 specific instructions. And after about a week, I got two people to email me bids. <laughs> um, and, but one of them was like, he knew he was up against a lot and man, he was like way less than everybody else. And he started today. So I hope it's going to go well. But um, just by just by doing that, I mean, if I would have just went with the average uh, landscaper, I probably would have been spending uh, between all seven jobs, 30 grand more um, than what I'm spending now, just by just taking the extra time to get a bunch of contractors to bid stuff out. And I feel like we're in a market where uh, you can do that, where you really couldn't do it a couple of years ago. Everybody was just too busy. It's competitive and everyone's looking for work again. So yeah, definitely. Um... It's, it's going to be beneficial for investors or people looking to save money to uh, get alternative methods for bids, for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. You absolutely should. You can definitely save money. Um, I want to switch gears here a little bit, Rachel. Obviously, you and Matt, uh, we're talking about Matt Bruner, by the way, for everyone listening. He's been on our podcast as well, but um, we wanted to get you guys both separate because you guys have both separate stories, obviously. Um, you guys are starting a masterminder. This is your second round going with your mastermind. Is that correct? Yeah. Can you tell us about the mastermind and what you're trying to accomplish with that? Yeah, that was all Matt's brainchild. Um, <laughs> seriously. Um, he, well, so let me back up. I had a client named Mo and Mo, um, he wanted to buy a duplex as his first home. And so we did. And then he said, after a year, I'm going to move out of here and I'm going to go buy conventional or, um, Actually, he's going to reuse his VA loan, but he was going to go buy a house next year and then rent out the duplex. And then he's going to keep doing that every year for 10 years. And then after 10 years, he's going to have 10 rentals, um, maybe more doors if he gets multifamily. And so Matt was thinking about it. He was like, yeah, everyone should be doing this. Um, and everyone that's not should be. <laughs> and so he wanted to host something that was specifically centered around that, um, that method. And then he built it off of the Burr model. So the weeks are broken up into um, the Burr book. So there's the buy week, what our buy box looks like, how we find deals, um, how we locate them, all that kind of stuff. We have the renovation portion. We have contractors come in and talk to them. Uh, we have a big sphere of 
contractors, obviously, some that like me, some that don't. Um, <laughs> and so they all come in, they talk to them. We talk about, you know, how much does a toilet cost? How much does painting a wall cost? Because they're just, they have no idea. And so it's a great introduction to like, how much is it gonna cost for like these little things that you don't even think about. Um, and then we talk about refinancing it. We have our lenders come in. We have a DSCR lender. Um, so that's the one that it doesn't matter what income you have. It doesn't matter what credit you have. You can just um, buy a house as long as the rent will pay for the property and you can't live in it. Um, we have a conventional lender come in. We have a hard money lender come in, all that kind of stuff. And the hard money lender talks about like how to buy it as well as refinancing it. We have the rental portion. We have a few property management companies come in um, and they talk about what they can rent it for um, versus like the property neighborhoods, where you should be buying these if you wanna buy and hold, um, what like the bedrooms will rent for, what adds more value bedroom versus bathroom, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and so they get exposure to that. And then we, I think we have a tax week too, where we go over um, taxes and we have a tax um, tax guy come in and he, he talks about all the implications of buying rentals and how to do that kind of stuff at the back end of it. And then um, the last week is just repeating it. So we just talk about how to repeat the process over and over. If you want to scale it, if you don't want to do a bunch a year, if you want to do just one a year, how does that work? All that kind of stuff. Very cool. And if people wanted more information on that mastermind or wanted to kind of take a look at what you're doing, where would they find information on that? They could um, call me at 509-771-8757, or they could go onto my Instagram page, Facebook page, our creative page, and you have all those links. Yep, yep. We'll, we'll get those definitely out in the podcast. And this is feeding the funnel, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so this is feeding the funnel for Rachel to be able to make these 150 calls a day or whatever. So yeah, this is great feeding stuff. Feeding the funnel. Feeding the funnel. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so going forward though, Rachel, like, obviously I know what you said you want to do with your out of market or out of state deals. Um, do you have any five-year goals or do you set yearly goals for yourself? Like, where do you want to be in five years? Oh, I set like quarterly goals. Um, <laughs> yeah, I have a one, three, five, 10, and then, um, retirement plan. Um, but it's recently changed to just one, three and five, because after five, I want to be retired. And I think I can be. Uh, if I buy 10 rentals this year and then 10 next year, that'll replace my entire cost of living and being alive as a human being. And then I'll just work if I want to and not because I have to. And that's everyone's goal, I think, to just work because they want to. That's awesome. Seems like you're on track. All right. Well, I think we're getting ready for the wind down. Nick, is there anything you wanted to add before we get to that point? No, I'm just blown away. <laughs> 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 You did it, Rachel. You blew Nick away. Thanks for that. We appreciate that. So now uh, real quick though, I do want to talk about the creative agents brand with you and Matt. Um, what is it? What is your mission with that? And what are you guys trying to do with that as well? So we have been talking about it a lot lately. Um, we're, I think we've decided we're going to go to real. Um, it's a virtual brokerage um, and it has just some great opportunities there. And I think it's going to be able to give us the opportunity to expand to other markets as well. Um, so I might be looking at getting my Ohio and West Virginia licenses, um, potentially it's up in the air. I don't know. Um, but yeah, we're, we're kind of looking at that and then potentially having people underneath of us, but we're still going back and forth between, um, wanting a team versus not having a team. So totally get it. It's a, a weird little balance at that spot. Like, am I growing right now or am I not? And, um, yeah, there's plenty of ways we grow as humans, obviously, but it doesn't all have to be linear in a, in a real estate field for sure. So, all right. So we're going to get down with some random, not random, but uh, predetermined wind down questions for us. You say that almost every time. Random. Well, not random. They're predetermined. I've got my list next to me and I put the word random in it. So I look at it. I'm just kind of glancing and I'm like, oh, we're going to do random. But underneath that is the predetermined question. So maybe that's just on my verbiage because I'm looking at notes off this because I'm a note looker. Um, but we're going to go into these wind down questions. So real quick, um, if there's one business or investing book you recommend every single investor read, Rachel, what do you, what would that be? I think the Burr book is just a no brainer. Um, either that or Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is just, I mean, they're the first ones anyone should ever read getting into investing. And that's just you. You read Grit, right? I read Grit, but that's more of a personal side, not investing side. Okay. Gotcha. If you had $30 million gifted to one of your bank accounts, what would be the first thing you spent it on? Ooh, I saw this one. That's such a hard thing to think about. Um, ooh, <laughs> I think I think I'd probably buy an entire town of like just rentals um, in a metropolitan. Um, just DSCR it and just do that, and then um, eventually I do want to go on like mission trips and everything like that. So probably put some money 
into a church to help fund that for other people as well as myself. And then, yeah, just try and build up more cash from that. Maybe start hard money loaning, all that kind of stuff. Got a lot of options with that much money for sure. Yeah, that's that's a ton. <laughs> if you had advice advice to give for an investor looking to get started on their you know first or second deal, what would that be? Start looking in the market every single day. Start looking at um, a deal under, if it's in the Spokane market or Idaho market, look under 200K every day, see what comes on the market um, and just see if it's good or bad deal by the pictures. Um, connect with a real estate agent, have them send you deals that they think are good, why they think they're good. Um, just start running numbers every single day. Do a deal a day, run numbers on it. I love that. Look under 200K every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If I had more knuckles, I think that'd be a knuckle tattoo for me. Look under 200K every day. <laughs> In Idaho, it'd be like, no search results. <laughs> no search results. <laughs> error, error. <laughs> All right. Uh, next question for you, Rachel. How do you define success? Ooh, living life well led um, with no regrets and a good family. So that would be my version of success and I think it's actually everyone's version. They just don't say that. <laughs> yeah. No, just being happy and enjoying your time and not having to worry. And that's the stress. We don't want the stress. Um, when you're not investing, what do you like to do with your free time? Oh, gosh, I do everything. Um, I teach dance on Mondays to little kids. Um, so I teach ballet and jazz. Um, that's kind of one of my passion projects. Eventually, I'd like to start a dance studio. Um, and then I go line and swing dancing, I go rock climbing, I go shooting, I go uh, kayaking, paddle boarding, hiking, snowboarding. Actually, I don't snowboard, I ski. Um, I went snowboarding a few times and I broke my arm, but I ski. Um, yeah, I wanna start snowmobiling. Um, I read like a book a day or like half a book a day. So I read a ton. Um, yeah, I wrote a book, it's not published. Oh, I was like, really? <laughs> Yeah, it's not. I don't know if it ever will be. It's it's pretty. I wrote it when I was seventeen. It's not very good. Chat GPT can fix that right up for you. I, th I thought about that actually. I did. Um, but yeah, so I do. I do so much of my free time. I I like to be a very active person. Next question, real quick. This is kind of a random one, but how do you have free time with how much you're making calls? I mean, calls shouldn't take you more than like three hours a day. Um, it really shouldn't. I do Mojo Dialer, so I I yeah, I pump them out a lot. Awesome. And then um, if anyone wanted to find out any more about you, where can they find you? I know we'll put links in the description, but uh, shout it out here as well if you want. Yeah, Instagram, Facebook, all of those things. Um, my handle's different on all of them, so you'll just have to check the links. Just follow the links and it's fine. <laughs> yeah, follow the links. Yeah, it's 2023. Follow the links. <laughs> it's 2023. Click a button or two. Get there. Yeah. Uh, Nick, any closing thoughts before we uh, wrap this up? No, um, I'm just impressed. I'm sure out there, people listening, I'm sure they're impressed as well. Uh, keep crushing it. Thanks for your inspiration. And um, we look forward to uh, having you on again someday. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. This was a really cool experience and I appreciate the opportunity. Glad to help for sure. Um, I think you're going to get invited to a lot more of these, to be honest with you, because your story is really cool and uh, you're really personal about it and uh, provide a lot of value. So thank you. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much for checking out the Investor Shed podcast. If you enjoyed your time, make sure to leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Follow along on YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram at The Investor Shed for shorts and promos about each episode. Do you want to be a guest or know someone who has great real estate investing advice and stories? Reach out to us at theinvestorshed at gmail.com.